I'm glad uh, that we have uh, Arya Levit from Yale. Uh, to be honest, I forgot the exact title, but it's around <laughs> the, st the permutation stability of uh, some yeah. amenable groups via random invariant subgroups, uh, something around that. Uh, uh, Arya, the, the yeah. stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh... And I'm, I'm glad, really glad to be invited to talk at this seminar. I've been really enjoying the, the talks so far. Um, so really the idea is to follow on uh, uh, Henry's wonderful talk from last week, where he talked about this uh, criterion by Becker, Lubotsky and, and Tom for permutation stability of uh, amenable groups and basically give you some applications and some from that work and some more applications from uh, the work of uh, Alex and, and, and myself. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm, if, if you were here last week, um, then you've, 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 you, you know about this criterion, but I'm not going to assume that. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by um, saying a few words about invariant random subgroups. So anyway, let's start. So for most of this talk, we will have G a uh, finitely generated uh, amenable group. So that means um, you can give it a presentation as such, where since it's, um, well, S is a set, S is a finite set of generators and set of relations, but allowing uh, infinitely presented groups, which is actually part of the motivation for my work with Alex. And now really quickly, I'll just remind you what uh, being amenable is. I'm sure you, you all know. So that there are several equivalent definitions. Uh, we will, uh, the one which is most handy and useful here is to assume the existence of a Follner sequence, which is a sequence of um, finite sets such that finite subsets of your group such that for any element, if you look at the displacement of those sets or what part of the set is being moved um, outside of that Fulner set. So in the limit, this goes to zero. So that's the definition of a Fulner sequence and those groups, a group is amenable if it has such a Fulner sequence. I just wanted to review the definition because I will be using Fulner sets and then uh, one more definition which of permutation stability, which uh, we've seen so many times this last semester. So I'm just going to super quickly um, um, write this down because, you know, I feel I should write this down before I state the becker lubowski tom criterion, uh, but I'm not going to discuss this in any uh, great detail. So we have the, um, so, sorry, um, uh, P stable stands for permutations table. And we have our group here. Uh, Seam N is just going to be the symmetric group on endpoints. Uh, by the way, I'm trying to give a definition which works just as well for infinitely presented groups. At this point, I don't, I'm not sure any longer which definitions we've previously seen in this seminar, but this is one definition which works even if your group is infinitely presented. Anyway, you define this uh, normalized Hemming metric on the symmetric group. One uh, way to write this down is as follows. You count the fixed points of that element, you normalize, and that's a B invariant metric on the symmetric group. Basically, you count the number of points where two permutations differ. Um, and in terms of this metric, you can define the following two notions. So you can define a sequence of hom almost homomorphisms, which is this sequence of, you know, set theoretic maps from your group to the symmetric group, such that for any pair of elements, if you try your, um, you know, you try to um, compose those two elements, then it's not necessarily a homomorphism, so you don't have the usual composition uh, uh, axiom, but 
uh, you almost have that asymptotically with respect to this metric. So that's a sequence of almost homomorphisms, which we've seen a lot of times during this uh, seminar and just uh, really trying to really quickly uh, review that. And we say that a sequence of almost homomorphisms is close to a homomorphism, provided there exists uh, a sequence of uh, honest homomorphisms, which is, um, you know, asymptotically close to this almost homomorphism for any uh, given element. So that's just uh, one variant of this definition for permutation groups, stability, permutation stability, and then permutation stability would mean every almost homomorphism is close to a homomorphism in the above sense. In, in other words, if I give you a home, almost homomorphism, you can, you know, you can correct it at a few points to get uh, a sequence of honest homomorphisms. Right. Uh, so that's the, I, and in this talk, I'm, I will only be interested in permutation stability, not the other various notions of stability with respect to other groups and other me metrics which are out there. Um, and uh, last week we had uh, Henry's uh, talk on the Becker uh, Lubotsky Tom criterion. And this is a uh, for finite generated enable groups to be permutation stable. And it says that uh, the group is permutation stable uh, if and only if, and this comes the, here comes the interesting part, which I will first write down and then explain every invariant random subgroup U of G is cosophic. And I'm using a slightly different terminology, I think from what Henry used, but I will explain that. So now I'm just now I'm just planning to talk for a few minutes about invariant random subgroups and uh, what are cosophic invariant random subgroups. And I know last week, Peter, uh, you were um, trying to uh, see the geometric um, uh, the geometry here and relate this to Benjamin's from convergence, so I'm, I'll try to present invariant random subgroups for, from a slightly more geometric, uh, slightly more geometric take on invariant random subgroups, Thanks. which can, uh, yeah, which which can in, in some sense be viewed as Benjaministrom convergence. So the way to get some more geometry here is to consider the Cayley graph. So, you know, you have a finitely generated group. There is a Cayley graph. Uh, formally speaking, it depends on the generating set. So it's this graph where the vertices are elements of J. And for edges, there is an edge between G and GS for every element and every generator. So note that the generator is written on the right because of this you get a group action. I mean, the group is acting on its scaly graph on the left, let's say, uh, which allows me to take any um, subgroup of G and consider the quotient, which is called the Schreier graph. And uh, maybe a very rough analogy would be to take something like a hyperbolic space quotient by a discrete group to get um, a hyperbolic manifold or take symmetric space and get a quotient that and get a locally symmetric manifold, et cetera. But here we are really allowing to take quotients by any subgroup whatsoever because we are in this uh, discrete setting. Anyhow, I'll denote by SG the set of all uh, Schreier graphs. So as I said, those are just all quotients of the Cayley graph by the left action of any subgroup whatsoever. And I should also remark that this set, well, this collection admits a, lo a local characterization, meaning uh, if, if you can look at graphs, which are where the edges are labeled by generators, 
and uh, you can locally detect whether this is a Schreier graph for your group by verifying that uh, using the relations and verifying that if you start at any point and follow a relation, you get a loop. So there is a certain local description. Also, there's a um, base point given by the identity coset. So in fact, this set of graphs admits um, a local description, so to speak. And then, then there's also a topology. So secretly, this is going to coincide with the Chabody topology Henry um, discussed la last time, but here is a more def a geometric minded definition. We say that two graphs in this family are close to each other. Um, if a large uh, balls at the identity are isomorphic, you know, preserving the edge labels, etc. So this gives some sort of an inverse limit topology. I guess this would typically be homeomorphic to a contour set. And it's an exercise to see that this is uh, just another way to um, um, get the Chabody topology on the space of all subgroups. And it has a carries a geometric uh, significance. Um, okay, now let me talk about invariant random subgroups. So those are just probability measures on on this space, and they have to be invariant. And uh, it's in, invariant, well, at least in the in the algebraic sense. It means uh, you have to be invariant for conjugation, but you can also make a geometric sense of invariance under a change of base point if you insist. So the same way you conjugate uh, a discrete group uh, acting on the hyperbolic space that would can be reflected by changing the base point. Uh, here also there is a certain action on this set of uh, Schreier graphs by change of base point and an invariant random subgroup is a random Schreier graph where the distribution is invariant under change of base point. Um, okay, and here is another way to think about what's going on. If I give you a radius, then after all, since everything is discrete, um, there are only finitely many, uh, say, and many possible balls of radius R, which you can see in any given Schreier graph. And an invariant random subgroup would just be, you know, a probability vector. So you can think of this as local statistics. What are the local statistics of R ball? Well, for each R, an IRS would determine the local statistics of R balls that you get to um, statistically see in this uh, picture. So this is like a probability vector. And on the space of IRS, there is the weak star uh, topology of convergence in weak star of probability measures. Um, that's what we use to, um, you know, to um, state the becker lubotsky tom criterion. And this is equivalent just to uh, convergence of, the, of these um, probability vectors. And if you really insist, you can think of this as being uh, a B, Benjamin Schramm convergence, which is, after all, um, just this a local convergence of a, a local convergence in, in statistics. Um, okay, so that's that was my geometric take on invariant random subgroups. By the way, please interrupt if you have any questions. And now I need to explain what are those Kosofic IRSs which appeared in the Becker Lubotsky Tom criterion. So for that, let's just look at the finite part of the Chobody space. Simply, those are the finite Schreier graphs. In other words, all the, all the graphs you can get by taking the quotient of the Cayley graph by a finite index subgroup. Then the, there are the finite IRSs. Um, oops, this is G here. All the invariant random subgroups, which are supported on the finite part. 
And the, mo the really interesting definition are the Kosofic ones. Uh, the Kosofic ones are, the, um, this is the weak star closure of the finite index ones. So this is where you start to see interesting stuff happening. Uh, so those are all the random objects, which are uh, limits in the statistical sense of finite objects. And to show you where this terminology of Kosofic uh, com is coming from, let me just make the following remark. So throughout the entire talk, we have an, an, an amenable group, but if instead we take a free group and then an, a normal subgroup in that free group, um, then in fact, you get an IRS, which is just an atomic uh, probability measure supported on this normal subgroup. But this also has a geometric interpretation because uh, the Cayley graph of the quotient group is after all, in a way, a Schreier graph for the free group where you just take, you know, the tree of the free group and act on the left by this normal subgroup. This is just the same as the Cayley graph of, of the quotient. And then there's the, the question of, can you approximate this uh, Cayley graph of, of the quotient F mod N by finite graphs, so un unstructured finite graphs, namely Schreier graphs for the free group, simply finite graphs without any additional structure. And then uh, the definition of this invariant random subgroup uh, being Kosofic precisely corresponds to the quotient being a Sophic group. Uh, so that's a notion introduced by Benji Wise. Um, and I'm not going to give you any other definition, but I think this is a this is actually a very concise and a nice definition for what a Sophic group is. Namely, it's a group whose uh, Cayley graph can be approximated statistically by finite unstructured graphs. Um, and this is also a good place to mention the Aldous Lyons conjecture, um, asking whether any IRS of the free group um, is a suffix. So in particular, if all the science is true, any group is suffix and, and the contrapositive <laughs> statement as well. Um, any, any questions? Oops. Okay, so now, uh, now I'm going to take uh, this notion in, in, of invariant random subgroups and come back to uh, uh, the becker lobotsky tom Criterion, and I'm going to try to give some applications. But before I begin, uh, I just want to remark that when you apply this criterion, you may assume that the invariant random subgroup in question is ergodic, namely uh, in, in the usual sense of, uh, of, of ergodic theory, namely you may assume it's not uh, you know, an untrivial convex combination of other probability, of two other probability measures. Uh, it's an easy exercise to see that um, it's enough to verify the, the criterion for uh, just for ergodic ones. And now let's, um, as an application, try to derive the uh, Arjan Seva Punescu uh, theorem. Uh, that the that a finitely generated abelian group is permutation stable, and here I should make it clear that this is a very deep and highly non-trivial theorem. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically illustrating that the uh, the power of the Becker-Lubotsky Tom criterion, since um, you know um, you you can get a highly non-trivial result out of it uh, fairly easily. And here, here is uh, how this goes. So you just take an, an ergodic uh, IRS of this group. And what, what is an ergodic IRS? So this is an, an abelian group. Uh, so it just has, since this is a probability measure invariant under conjugation, which is not a convex combination, it's clear that it has to be constant. So it has to be 
at, at the Iraq probability measure supported on some subgroup, any subgroup whatsoever. So there is some uh, fixed subgroup H of your uh, abelian group, and the IRS is just an atomic probability measure on that uh, group. And then clearly, uh, you can take uh, your group, whatever it, it may it may be, and write it as an intersection of finite index subgroups, I guess by the structure theorem for finitely generated abelian groups. It's really obvious. Um, and it follows that your IRS, which is just an atomic probability measure is the weak star limit of the corresponding IRSs. So what's special about this situation is that every ergodic IRS is just a point, and therefore the two topologies, the Chabody topology and the IRS topology coincide, which makes life uh, much easier, but obviously that's not the case in general. Um, uh, okay, so if you are confused, I've just verified that any ergodic IRS of this particular group is indeed uh, a weak star limit of finite index ones, hence uh, Kosofic, hence by the Becker-Lobotsky-Tom criterion, this group is permutation stable, which is, as I remarked, a highly non-trivial result in itself. Um, okay, so that was one application. Let me give you one more application, which is from the- uh, yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Uh, is there a, a kind of a group theoretical criterion that would ensure in more general, that every ergodic IRS is uh, is Dirac is 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 one point. Like, um, is there something which is less trivial than the case of Z of a billion? Yeah, I'm not sure. It probably translates to some very basic group theoretical uh, property, but uh, uh, we we can discuss it later. Um, yeah, any, I think it just means any subgroup is normal, right? Well, why not every subgroup? Any, any subgroup with finite, yeah. Well, maybe you can think of, about this as I present the next example, <laughs> um, because yeah. So, so for, for the next example, you take, um, which is an example from, the, uh, from that paper itself, you consider a more general group, a finitely ge generated nilpotent group. And now uh, the, proof is, the proof that every IRS is, um, yeah, and take, uh, take, uh, take an ergodic IRS. And I want to sh prove it's cosophic, it's slightly more involved, but not more than a few lines. So um, we use some group theoretical facts. This group is notarian, which means that uh, every subgroup is finitely generated. Oh, did you just lose my screen sharing? Can you still see my uh, screen? Oh, here it is. So I'm using the fact that this group is notarian, which means every finitely, any, any subgroup whatsoever is finitely generated. If you think about it, you'll see that the space of subgroups is countable because of this fact. And now here comes um, a very nice, like uh, ergodic theory, a very, very fundamental ergodic theory fact. Uh, if you have uh, um, an invariant ergodic probability measure on a countable set, it has to be the uniform measure on some finite orbit, right? Which means there has to be um, a group such that you can, um, such that um, this, sorry, this measure is just a convex combination of finitely many conjugates of one given group. And because of this, the normalizer of this group must have better have a finite index. Um, 
in your group. And Alex, maybe to your question. So for instance, a notarian group in which, um, a notarian group in which every subgroup is normal would be an example of what you were asking. Aria, can you say again, what is N, big N, capital N and H and like- H Oh yeah, 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 I'm sorry. So big N is just an integer. In fact, it's this integer. Uh, it's the index. Uh, so what, what I'm saying here is you have a countable uh, space with a G action and you have an invariant probability measure on that. So abstractly, there, it has to be a uniform measure on a single orbit, right? Um, and H, let, let H be any representative of that orbit. And if you translate back to group theory, it means that the normalizer is a finite index subgroup. Uh, let big N be that index, right? Um, oops, this here should be, um, yeah, sorry, this should be some. Um, so, some set of coset representatives, G and is this better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and now what you do is you use one more group theoretical fact, namely you use the fact that every a uh, finite, finitely generated subgroup is also uh, profinitely closed. Um, this allows you to write edge again as their section of some finite index subgroups. Uh, th this time those subgroups are finite index in, uh, in, in this normalizer, which is a finite index uh, in its own right. Um, I mean, those subgroups are finite index and normal in uh, the normalizer. Yeah, there is some group theory uh, trick which allows you to consider the following family of invariant random subgroups, um, which are of finite index. And these will converge. So I'm not giving you all the details, but this will converge and we start to the original one. So a feature of this situation that this proof uses is that there is a finite set of coset representatives, which is at the same time uh, a set of coset representatives for uh, the group H you started with, and also for some finite index subgroup. And this feature will come up again later. Okay, I hope that's clear. I haven't given you all the details, but um, I, well, it's not completely trivial, but essentially it's a few, line, few lines prove that a finitely generated nilpotent group is permutation stable by verifying that every ergodic IRS is cosophic. Um, so those are all very nice examples, but in, in this talk, I, I, I just, I, I want to, um, consider slightly more complicated groups in which the space of invariant random subgroups is more involved and really involves some ergodic theory or some more complicated um, dynamics. And uh, so for instance, in my work with Alex, we considered the lamplighter group and I'll give you an example here. So this group uh, is the width product of Z mod 2Z with uh, Z, or another more standard way to write this is the semi-direct product of Z acting on this direct sum simply by computing uh, coordinates. So you have the direct sum of Z many copies of Z mod 2Z and Z is acting on that computing co coordinates. That's the lamplighter. Uh, let me give you an example of an untrivial invariant random subgroup here. I think this example is, I, th I believe, by Hartman and Tammuz. So what you do is that you consider the Bernoulli space. So, so you know the space of all bi-infinite sequences of zeros and ones with the Bernoulli measure, which is IID flips of coins. 
you flip a coin for each coordinate, you get the Bernoulli measure. And now there is a way to go from a point in this Bernoulli space uh, and get a subgroup. And the subgroup is defined as a subgroup of the lamplighter, which is defined as follows. Um, it's the it's a restricted direct sum. So it's just the group spent by those coordinates where uh, the point is one. So it's simply the subgroup of uh, this of if I call this group N, this is the derived group of the lamplighter. So if I consider the subgroup of the de derived group generated just by coordinates prescribed by this point X in the Bernoulli space, I get a subgroup. For each point, I get a subgroup. So there's a certain map like that phi. Uh, and if you push forward the Bernoulli measure um, using this map, now you get an invariant random subgroup which all lives on this derived subgroup N here. So, okay. Um, so that's just an example of one particular invariant random subgroup you can get for the lamplighter group. And how do you uh, see that this is specific? So let me uh, give, you, give you the outline of this proof that this particular measure is specific. Uh, I guess you might be tempted to look at something like periodic points. I use some sort of properties of periodic points in this uh, Bernoulli shift. Um, but and you need to get a finite index subgroup. So there are several ways to do this. One way to do that is to observe that uh, this the derived group is isomorphic to a certain ring. It's just uh, this ring, right? Um, and, um, <clears throat> and then what you can do is you consider a finite set of points in the Bernoulli space, which uh, vanish outside a small window. Um, and that this gives you the following invariant random subgroup. So it's a convex combination of finitely many um, groups defined by those finitely many points. And what you do is you take uh, N Z semi-direct product with the following thing. You take, uh, this, is a poly this is supposed to be a polynomial, an element in this string, right? Um, so I hope that's it's clear what's going on. So what I define here is a probability measure on the space of subgroups of the lamplighter, which is a convex combination of finitely many, um, like a uniform measure on finitely many um, points, where each point is of this form. And this is, well, just NC, semi-direct product, a certain subgroup, uh, which is defined uh, using this correspondence between um, the derived, observing that the derived subgroup is actually a ring. So this has some sort of a model, a model structure. Uh, if you don't like this ring theoretical uh, take on this, you can just uh, think of this guy here being the, the annihilator of the periodic points. So you observe that the Pontryagin dual of um, this group is the set of, is basically the Bernoulli space. And then there is the finite set of periodic points. The annihilator of that is the, is the finite index subgroup, which is just uh, this one. Um, right, so that, and, and in fact, there are a few things to check here, right? It's not, uh, so I'm claiming that um, UN converges in the weak star topology to mu, but there are a few things to check. Well, first, it's not at all clear that this is an invariant random subgroup. For that, you need to check that uh, those subgroups I, I, I put here are, uh, what you see here is uh, a union of conjugacy classes. 
So this better be true for this to be an invariant random subgroup. Uh, and it happens to be true. So you, you have to check what happens when you act on this set of, on this finite set of some groups by an element of the lamp lighter. Uh, so there is something to check. And then you have to check that um, indeed you have this weak star convergence. And it's, it's not hard, but I think it's believable because uh, after all, weak star convergence is all about uh, what happens to uh, balls of specific radius. And I think what's, what is intuitive about those groups is that they simulate uh, the given probability measure on larger and larger balls, because those are like groups which become periodic after longer and longer time. So um, they, they, they are supposed to simulate um, and also this coordinate goes away to infinity. So it's supposed to simulate the given invariant random subgroup. That's why it works. Um, yeah, a bit of hand, hand waving, but are there any questions? Should the name of the variable in the definition of the ring be T? Is this uh, T, oh yeah, yeah, thank you. The variable is T, indeed. Thanks. Is it clear okay. what kind? Is it yeah. clear what kind of action induces mu n, or did I miss it? Like what kind of action? Um, oh, no. Well, Space. first of first of all, it's not a transitive action because you have a few separate conjugacy classes. Uh, I don't think it's. Well, down to finitely many conjugacy classes, and the actions are just the actions on the um, coset spaces, but you have to work it out. Okay, thank you. What, what I was trying to uh, get across here is that um, it, things become more complicated once you have more complicated invariant random subgroups. And this was just one example. Note that I used the Bernoulli measure, but I don't think there is any classification of all the probability measures on the shift space. So you have to do something more sophisticated if you want to give a general proof. And this is where uh, some ergodic theory comes in. And in our proof, we rely on the ergodic theorem, the pointwise ergodic theorem for amenable groups. Uh, this version is due to Linden Strauss, although I think it's from his uh, uh, MA thesis, I believe, but there, there, there were previous versions as well. So in this theorem, you have a finitely generated uh, amenable group and you have a Fulner sequence. Um, right, so there's a Fulner sequence. The theorem supposes that this is a tempered Fulner sequence, whatever that means, but I'm not going to worry about this since uh, Elon shows that any Fulner sequence admits of tempered subsequence and we don't mind passing to a subsequence in this business. So I'm just not going to worry about this assumption. Uh, and then your group has a um, probability measure preserving action on a compact metric space. Uh, and U is a uh, Gene variant ergodic uh, probability measure. Um, the theorem says, or at least one way to formulate this theorem is that almost every point, so for, for all typical points where typical being uh, belonging to some uh, Connell set, if you uh, consider the part of the orbit of that point uh, parameterized by the by the Fulner set. And you get those uh, atomic probability measures, they will converge in weak star to the probability measure you started with. So it's a certain theorem that in this formulation allows you to reconstruct uh, the measure. Um, work of pointwise version actually in your proof? Yeah, yeah, this is the pointwise ergodic theorem. Yeah, we need that. 
you really need it. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe there is another proof, but we definitely yeah, are. Yeah, uh, you... Types, so the kind of functional analytic ones are much easier, like the von Neumann. Um, no, but the whole, yeah, the whole point here is to, is to definitely, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, I agree that it does look like you need this version, yeah, the point one. Because the, the idea here is, uh, what I was trying to convey is that weak star convergence is in fact quite, compli is a quite complicated notion because you have to worry about uh, probability measures and those uh, vectors of, local statistics. And what we are trying to do here is to, in a way, uh, de-randomize the, the Becker-Lubotsky-Tom statement by saying that instead of worrying about a measure, it's enough to worry about one typical uh, object, one typical group. And then you have a handle, you have a group, uh, and you can just work with that algebraically. So that's why we actually, uh, need the pointwise version of this theorem. Uh, and let me just tell you what this gives in terms of IRS in the special case where this space is the space of IRS of a group. Uh, I will introduce this useful notation, Fn star h. This is just uh, the, the probability measure, the, uh, the convex combination of all uh, conjugates just a handy notation. And then uh, the pointwise ergodic uh, theorem for amenable groups would say that for uh, almost every subgroup, uh, this weak star converges to mu. And to get help is cosophic, okay? But you might object to this point since uh, a typical subgroup of the IRS is not finite index, of course. So it's not, we are not there yet. Like just getting this convergence is nice, but we need to prove that mu is the limit of finite index subgroups, not just of any sequence like that. And for this reason, we introduced this uh, notion that we decided to call a wise approximation, which is really just uh, inspired by some other work of Benjamin, uh, Benji Weiss and uh, really tailored to this, uh, to our needs here. So what is a wise approximation of a subgroup? It's a sequence of pairs, uh, K, I, F, I. So it's quite, it, I mean, it's, it's uh, elementary, but also delicate. So what are those objects? K, I, the K, I's are finite index subgroups. And the F, I's are transversals. Um, so you need to specify the transversals. That's the lesson we learn here. And in fact, we can be a bit more general. So those can be finite to one transversals. So namely a disjoint union of finitely many families of choices of coset transversals. Um, okay. And the, the really the important part of this definition is well, if you look at the space of all probability measures on the Chobody space, which is where the invariant random subgroups. Sorry, what's a transversal? Can you, what do you mean by transversal? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, just um, a section, uh, a choice of coset representatives, just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, I guess it's not a st standard terminology. Okay, so here we require that uh, if you go like this with the your group H, which you are trying to approximate in this sense versus uh, those objects. So in the space of probability measures, the distance goes to zero, which means if one sequence has a limit, the other one has the same limit, okay? And the first limit, those are invariant random subgroups. Those are in fact in, so these ones are in fact in, in the finite part of the IRS. Uh, these ones are not even invariant because I'm, you know, I'm just looking at a part of the conjugacy sequence of in some infinite index <clears throat> subgroup. 
but this definition is telling me that the two sequences have the same limit, which can be used to argue as follows. If I know uh, one sequence converges to mu, then by this assumption, the other sequence will have the same limit in the space probability measures, but those are, uh, as we just said, finite index. So this guy will be cosophic. Um, okay, I am, the moral of this is the following corollary. Uh, if, so let G be finitely generated am amenable and um, U be an ergodic IRS. Uh, if mu almost every subgroup has a wise approximation uh, with respect to Fulner sets, uh, then um, U is cosophic. So what's, what, what I find nice about this theorem, first, as I said, it allows you to de-randomize the becker lobotsky tom criterion, because instead of worrying about probability measures, you just need to worry about this typical subgroup. And then uh, the sets Fn, they play a dual role. So they are both Fulner sets. At the same time, they are transversals, uh, which is a notion that Benji uh, studied. So by the way, this theorem essentially is an if and only if, at least if you assume the group is residually finite by this work of Benji Weiss I'm alluding to, you can make this uh, an if and only if statement. So an invariant random subgroup is cosophic if and only if almost every subgroup um, with respect to some fixed sequence of Fulner sets. It's really a, a pretty much a thinly whaled uh, restatement of the pointwise uh, ergodic theorem. <clears throat> um, and and one one more remark is that this condition is um, this condition of uh, something being a wise approximation to a subgroup is fairly easy to check. All you need to check is. So given this sequence of finite index subgroups and transversals, which may or may not be Fulner sets, what you need to check is that uh, the number of elements such that um, the groups H and KN differ on that element. So that, uh, that conjugate is either inside one, but not the other or vice versa. Um, this converges to zero. Um, right, so this is the numerical, uh, a numerical way to test whether uh, the sequence of pairs is a wise approximation, which we found to be very useful because that's what we actually did in our work. We construct some sort of a, um, we construct the wise, wise approximations and then we verify this condition. So this is, for instance, how we are able to prove the following theorem. Uh, so this is what we actually do. Uh, it's what we do is slightly more general than just doing the lamplighter group. We do so-called uh, permutational reef products, which are defined as follows, but Really, it's not that much more than the left lighter, but this is as far as we were able to push this method. So you have a pair of finitely generated uh, abelian groups, and you let one of them act on a set with finitely many orbits. Uh, and then a permutational reef product Um, would be um, would be a reef product. It's denoted as follows. It's just uh, the semi-direct product where Q is acting on. So what you do this time, Q is adding acting on a set, and you take 
uh, direct sums of the base group. B is called the base group. You take direct sums of the base group over this set, and you let and you then you let the acting group act on that permuting coordinates. So just um, th that's a permutational uh, brief product which uh, we show is p stable. So this includes the lamp lighter. It also includes groups such as uh, z ref product z square. And we do this by constructing uh, a wise approximation. And now uh, at this point of the talk, I am i don't have that much time left. And my two options are either to describe this wise approximation in more detail, or I can perhaps skip, uh, which would take, require some effort, or I can skip and talk about the other results that we obtained for the BH, Neum uh, BH Neumann groups. Uh, I don't know if there are any preferences with, with the audience. Um, Maybe the BH Neumann, because I think now it's the pretty technical and those interested can go to the paper. Uh, just allow me to say, to stress the groups that we were not able to prove, because there is an interesting story here. There is a classical theorem of Philip Hall uh, going back to the 50s, I believe, that every meta every finitely generated meta abelian groups is res dually finite. That's a very beautiful theorem. Uh, I mean, even if you don't care about meta abelian group so much, it's a, it has a very beautiful proof because it's based on kind of Hilbert Nullstellsatz. The way you think about it, you think. If you have an abelian by abelian group, or if you want another way, a, a degree two solvable group, you can look at the commutator subgroup as a module for the commutator quotient. The commutator quotient is a finitely generated abelian group. So it's group algebra is basically a polynomial, not a free polynomial algebra, but it's a, it's a polynomial algebra. It's a, it's a finitely generated ring acting on a module. So you use kind of a commutative algebra, or if you want, uh, uh, which is the dual of algebraic geometry, to prove this theorem that every finitely, that every res, uh, meta abelian group is res dually finite. We do believe, and we cannot prove, that every meta abelian is stable. If this is true, it will be a far, far reaching generalization of that theorem. It will be so much stronger. And it's kind of interesting that even here, that uh, we don't expect to prove it by direct uh, group theoretical properties, but we kind of replace the commutative algebra by dynamic energodic theory. So that will be a nice, uh, Kind of a nice story to replace the, the commutative algebra by dynamic and ergodic to prove a much stronger theorem. And a, and a, a last sentence is that that's a, a um, solvable group of derived length two is the maximum possible for such a theorem because we derive length three, we know example of group which are non a solvable group which are non-stable. And we don't really understand even conjecturally, maybe there is a semi-conjecture when a, sol a solvable group is, is stable or not. It must be first of all rest dually finite, but even among the rest dually finite groups, we know groups which are not stable. And uh, maybe uh, we can suggest a conjecture, but uh, it's not it's not clear. So that's kind of a direction which is completely open. Yeah, Alex, thank you very very much for completing the those remarks and completing the picture here. So I have to say, when we started this project, I perhaps naively aimed uh, or we aimed to cover all metabolian groups. And really a lot of the arguments work in that generality, but then we had to restrict to the so-called permutational metabelian groups where this 
module Alex just described is a permutational module like this one. And, and unfortunately, then we had to restrict even further to split permutational reef products, which is the same as split permutational metabelian groups. Um, and I agree with Alex that going back here to um, deal with all metabelian groups would be a great theorem, which because it will ge really generalize uh, this whole the theorem by whole that metabelian are residually finite. Yeah, I should, uh, yeah, that, I'm really glad you mentioned uh, this story. And I also agree with you that I will skip the details of constructing uh, this Weiss approximation because surprisingly to you, at least to me, it, it is more technical than you might expect, but you can read about that in the paper. And the, the really the underlying idea is what I just did here, but it gets uh, more involved. Um, okay, so with my rem re remaining time, I will um, tell you about those uh, lovely uh, BH Neumann groups, which I learned from uh, learned about from Alex. To my, uh, I was happy to learn from Alex about those groups because they are really uh, lovely. So in thirty seven, uh, Neumann introduced those groups because he wanted to have uh, an uncountable uh, family of finitely generated, in, indeed two generated uh, groups. Um, you can take it, well, I'm, I'll show you how to do that. If you haven't seen it, I guess it could be a, an untrivial exercise in elementary group theory. Of course, what Newman didn't consider is amenability, but it's also, uh, uh, fairly amenable. I'll show you in a, in, a, in a few minutes. And then with, Ale with Alex, we proved that those all, all these groups are the BH Neumann groups, the, the entire uncountable family are all, well, well, they are amenable and applying the becker lubotsky tom criterion using our ergodic theory methods, we proved that they are all, uh, oops, what am I writing? The, BH Newman uh, groups are all uh, permutation stable. Uh, clearly, they are uh, infinitely presented if, since they are uncountably many, non isomorphic ones. Um, okay, so let me show you how to construct these groups. And Alex, please tell me when I run out of time. Uh, so is, this depends on some, on some data, the data being a sequence of monotonely increasing integers, all greater than two. So that's the data which you are allowed to specify. That's why you get uncountably many different groups of this family. For each uh, sequence like that, just it's going to be convenient to consider uh, finite sets. So I'm just going to use this to denote the set ranging from minus Ri to uh, plus Ri. So that's a set of size um, twice Ri plus one. Let's denote this Ni, which is an odd integer. Uh, right, so we have a sequence of integers. We have this sequence of finite sets. I guess I, I want to think of this as a, a direct limit of sets. I don't see something's happening on my screen. Is that common? My screen also shows there is a problem, but I'll try to uh, reconnect my iPad. Okay. Now it's fine, right? Correct. Yes, that's much better. Okay, so then you get a sequence of alter alternating groups acting on those finite sets. And since I want to think of this as a Take certain- Take line, line back because uh, you were speaking, but we could not see. Oh, 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 oh. Now we can see, uh, but I wasn't following what you were saying. Oh, oh okay, I'm sorry. So there is, um, so the data for those groups is uh, 
is an arbitrary infinite monotony increasing sequence of integers all greater than two. Then given such a sequence, you define, you consider finite sets where each set is parameterized from minus Ri to plus Ri. And therefore it has, and it's, it, it's, um, it has size twice Ri plus one, which is an odd integer. Oh yeah, once again, your screen disappear. Okay. Um, okay, and then you have the, uh, the corresponding alternating groups. And I want to think of this as a direct, as a direct system with the direct limit being uh, infinity. And this is like the finitary alternating group on the integers. Okay. And here is a picture that should make this uh, more better. So here you have those finite sets, uh, R1, R2, etc. And you have the finite alternating groups acting on those. And here in the limit, uh, you have the direct limit of this system, which is a copy of Z with infinity acting. I'm, I'm just setting up everything to define those, um, to be able to define those groups. Um, associated to this, there's of course the direct product of those groups, which is a profinite group. And the BH Neumann group in question will be uh, a prof certain countable but profinitely dense subgroup generated by two elements. So this will be the uh, BH Neumann group that you get out of this data since you can choose this data arbitrarily and you can also verify that for different choices. Data, you get nice and more. Um, in this way, you get really an uncountable family of those two generated groups. So I just need to tell you. Oh, yeah. yeah. You start with the direct limit, and now we talk about the, the product. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. The direct limit will come. Uh, yeah, I don't need a direct limit to define the groups. I'll just need it for, for okay. some other discussion later. I'm sorry. You're right. Um, yeah, I don't need a direct limit to define what this group is. <clears throat> um, so what are those two elements? Uh, one of them is, well, I just need to tell you what it does at each coordinate. And one of them is a free cycle, which acts everywhere in, the, in this way. So it's a free, cyc free cycle acting everywhere and in the limit as you know, just a very tiny uh, free cycle. The other one is more interesting is the full cycle. Uh, so minus, minus Ri plus Ri. Um, so this is an Ni cycle, hence both are in elements of this alternating group. Uh, so the, the other one acts like so, it's a full cycle. And in the limit, it's just a shift, uh, a non-finitary shift of the, of Z, right? Um, and, uh, clearly those two elements at each coordinates by very basic group theory, they generate so the projection to each coordinate is dense and you can in fact go further and show that this entire group is profinitely dense because the AIs are non-isomorphic simple groups. And, um, and that's your group G. So it's just the group generated by these two uh, elements. And to understand it better, I'll give you a few more facts about its structure. So first of all, so why is it amenable for instance? It has a normal sub subgroup. So if you consider the normal normal closure of this uh, free cycle, in other words, the group generated by all the conjugates of the uh, that cycle by powers of the <laughs> sigma. Um, 
so so this is well this is clearly a normal subgroup and there's just uh one element i mean the powers of sigma are missing but it's easy to see that g will be the semi-direct product of the group generated by sigma together with n once you add sigma to, to this once you put back once you throw in sigma it's going to normalize n and generate everything so g is in fact has some similarity it's uh, some similarity to the lamplighter in that it's a semi-direct product and the acting group is a copy of z and uh, moreover note that this n is locally finite the reason for this if you only allow finitely many conjugates of this transpos transposition you will maybe have something which looks like that but you are only restricted to act inside a finite group so any any finite number of conjugates of tau um, in, is still constrained to belong to lie lie in some finite group so n is locally finite uh, and being a semi-direct product of, of z and a locally finite group g is amenable so we have constructed this amenable bh uh, neumann group um, and um, it has some more structure for instance uh, it has a tail map so what's the tail map for now the a infinity will come back into the picture so a1 a2 etc i'm considering an arbitrary element of the bh neumann group and uh, it has uh, its action and it can do it it can act in an arbitrary way here so because it group works you name it a pretty large element it can act on it on an arbitrary in an arbitrary way on an ar arbitrary number of those ais but starting from some finite point say ig it has to stabilize and eventually it has a constant action for the remain for for all of the large enough ais and this is the tail map so uh, if I put this action here, I get a tail map from um, Z semi-direct product um, N to uh, Z semi-direct product um, alt um, yeah, so well, the, the, the tail map also takes into account the fact that there could be uh, a shift here, which will translate to a non finitary shift on A infinity. Right, so we have this amenable group. It has this nice uh, tail map, which is a surjection to, uh, to, a much, uh, to another group, which is much easier to understand. So you see, and uh, you see, it's interesting to note that uh, this tail map, its image is independent of the data that goes into the BH Neumann group, which means that uh, the, the difference between the different BH Neumann groups is essentially the kernel of the tail map. So if you work out what the kernel is, you'll see that uh, that's why the different BH Neumann groups are non-isomorphic. Um, and then what do we do here um, is we use our waste, waste approximation technique, namely we take uh, an ergodic IRS of this group, and then we take H, which is a, a typical subgroup, uh, typical meaning the ergodic theorem applies to, to H, and um, now we want to construct. Um, we want to construct a wise approximation. So, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just show you the, 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 the quickly the easy argument, and then I'll stop. So I'm going to assume that H lies inside this normal subgroup. 
uh, inside the uh, which is the uh, Bilanese, which is the derived subgroup. Oh, yeah. There is another argument. I don't want to the to disturb you. This is your talk, but I feel like yeah. the the audience will appreciate maybe even more if you will mention this theorem of Verschik that we use because that's kind of a beautiful and kind of relevant. Uh, and it's maybe even more important than our work in some sense. Um, I, okay, I, I, I definitely agree. Okay, so I, I, I don't have time to show you the, the details, but I, what I will do is I will take this invariant random subgroup and I will uh, push it forward using the tail map. That's why, I, that's why I need this tail map. And then I will get an IRS of uh, Z semi-direct product of the alternating group. That's the starting point in what we do. And uh, luckily for us, there is a theorem of Verschik, which is one of the first theorems about invariant random subgroups where he uh, classify the IRS of the um, finitary alternating groups. And I will just uh, finish by telling you what this classification is. And it's pretty elegant. Uh, all the IRSs, uh, I'm going to hand wave. All IRS come from uh, random colorings. What do I mean by that? Take a Z. So this is supposed to be a, a picture of um, finite part of Z. What Verschik says is that you are allowed to choose either a finite or an infinite number of colors, uh, and then choose either uh, for each color, choose what is the probability of you using that color. A two red, a color red with probability one third, a color blue with probability two thirds. And I, I'm having this random coloring of uh, Z with probability one, each color is being used infinitely many times. So the, the corresponding subgroup is basically uh, the set wise stabilizer of this coloring, except there could be a special color which you are required to point wise stabilize. So one color, if say, um, yeah, for that I need more than two colors, but um, basically every IRS is, is just, uh, you, you, you uh, is given as follows, you color Z randomly, and then <clears throat> uh, your random subgroup is the essentially the, the setwise stabilizer of this coloring, except there is a special color, which is you are required to um, pointwise stabilize. Um, yeah, well, I'm out of time, but this is, the, this is the starting point of what we do with those BH Neumann groups we push forward the IRS to A infinity and apply Verschitz theorem. <clears throat> so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, we have like one or two minutes for very quick uh, uh, questions, if there are still some questions. May I ask a question about a comment of Alex about solvable groups? You have mentioned that um, you have some conjectural description of which solvable groups are stable, or can you comment? Yeah. Uh, I can, I, I should mention to you first the conjecture which failed. The original conjecture was that maybe a, a, a solvable group, a residually finite solvable group, will be stable if and only if it is left. Yes. Now, this turns out to be not correct. Like, uh, there are stable groups which are, uh, uh, which are not left. For example, the, Berna, the Baumschlag solitar group. So, it's not necessary condition. If you look at the proof that Arya gave for the for the abelian important group, he kind of used the fact that they are left, but it turns out that this is not necessary. Now we we think that there is a notion um, 
now I forgot the, the name of it. Um, it's not so a popular notion, but it's, it's like extending the situation uh, uh, of the Baumschlag solitaire group. And when a group is acting on another one by like Z acting on Z1 over P, uh, what is called the uh, uh, Oren, you remember we talked about that and now I forgot the name. You remember the name? Contractable, it's not, it's called? Uh, the solvable group which are contractable, I, I forgot. Constructable. Contractable. Co no, constructable. Constructable, sorry, constructable, right. There is some notion like that of groups which is kind of the best way to define inductively and, uh, which call constructible, and it's known that all constructible solvable groups are residually finite, so that's a good start. And there is a feeling that what you get there is basically either you do a cyclic extension or some kind of a bounce like solitary extension. So we feel that because for polycyclic group, we know that they are stable, and for bounce like solitary, we know that they are stable, that a, at least we think that this is the next step to prove that they are stable, and maybe this will be if and only if, but we are, we are not sure, we don't, we really don't know. Usually the next step after poly, polycyclic group is the so-called uh, min-max min solvable groups, but we have examples of mean max solvable groups which are not stable, so those cannot be stable. Like a fi finite proof of rank, you can have a finite proof of rank group. Right, so if we can have finite proof of rank which are not stable, right. This is the Abel group. It's a group which constructed by Abels at the time, many years ago. He constructed it for completely different reason, but, uh, but his group, we proved that is not stable. So it's a bit mysterious here, what's the precise uh, if and only if condition, we don't... May I ask another question? So uh, uh, you have mentioned that uh, you expect metabolian groups uh, all to be stable, right? Yeah, well, yeah, that's, I think there is a good chance, yeah. And uh, can you say, uh, is there a particular example of a metabolian group uh, for which um, one does not yeah, know? The, the, the first example is free, free metabolian yeah. group. This is the first one which we don't know. You don't know whether so, it's right, right. You might think so, that this would be even easier than the lamp lighter, but it's not. Uh, we need a, a, Arya showed you very nicely that we opt for all metabillion, we, we compromise for less, we compromise for less. Some of this looks like we are almost there, but it didn't work. And even that paper about the lamp lighter is eventually 30 something pa pages. You know, it's eventually, you feel like you're almost there, but you are not there. So we are not, we are not sure, but, but the free metabillion group will be a great uh, first example. Yes, so there was this intermediate class between general metabolians and uh, those permutational reef products where the, I think they're called uh, permutational metabolian groups. So w w which the free uh, metabolian group is, so that's probably, okay. that's just within the, probably just within the reach of our methods, but we weren't quite able to oh, get that's there. That's the first case, like... Uh... And for, for example, for metabillion and finite proof and rank, you know, it's, it's true, right? Metabillion and finite proof and rank. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. This may be more likely to emit, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, that, that's, that's probably, yeah, that's probably, oh, okay. No, they probably would have, uh, okay, that's no. Even this is not clear because they don't have countably, countably many subgroups. If you have direct, even this, I'm not sure. But it's this may be doable. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, this is not, not so different uh, from bombs like solitaire. Yeah. And 
and policy clear clearance. What? Sorry. So because they they are maybe not so far um, from the bounds like solid. Like solid. From bounds like solid and from polycyclic groups. So right, right. But I think I think that if you take even bounds like solid and you take a direct sum of z z one over p cross z one over p semi-direct product with z kind of acting on that it's suddenly less clear uh, somehow i don't really remember i never thought about it seriously but uh, yeah that should be maybe an easier case but even this i don't want to swear we have some unpleasant surprises you know it looks like like solvable group are easy and they're not at all easy somehow <laughs> Maybe I and maybe one more question. Maybe not so relevant for what was told today. But so for amenable, you have this uh, criteria, right? But uh, and for non-amenable, um, nothing. <laughs> really, nothing. Yeah, like uh, there are some cases that maybe we can prove something, but some of we don't have uh, any general machinery. You know, like uh, we mentioned the cohomological uh, machinery for this. Uh, for venues uh, norm and things like that, but uh, for permutation stability for non-amenable uh, non group, um, we know very little. And, uh, you know, and those cases which you know, you know by, you know, maybe working it out, but not really any, any no general theorem. Uh, let's face it, till two or three years ago, there was only a handful of examples of stable groups, of a permutation stable group. And as Arya showed, now at least we have uncountably many. But uh, this is only due to this criterion for, for amenability, for the non-amenable. Uh, of course, you can cheat, you know, you can take free product of solvable group, right? I mean, that's clear to you, right? If you take of course, we can find the take two amenable group uh, which are stable and take their free product. So you will get a non -stable, uh, a stable non amenable. I'm not saying that we don't have examples, but somehow we don't have a real, a real uh, method to prove. You see, surface group is the first example. You remember uh, uh, Lazarovich gave a talk here, he uh, showed the surface groups are flexible stable, which is weaker than stable. And this needed a, a beautiful argument using some uh, topological argument, etc. And we don't know if they are stable or not. And in an amenable case, if you have locally finite by cyclic, um, you have some general no effect. In fact, I tell you, we, we even tried. There is an analog results. There is an analogous, uh, analogous construction to, to B.H. Neumann that you can do with groups of Lie type instead of the symmetric group. Or like take SLN FP, fix P, and take SLN FP when, when N goes to infinity. And it's, it's, I remember that we thought that the method should work there, and even there we couldn't do it. And that's exactly a case like that. It's locally finite by cyclic, and we couldn't do it because the theorem of Verschik there yeah, we, was, was uh, what? No, was not, no yeah. Uh, yeah, we had the input of Verschik's theorem to, to Verschik's cut, theorem cut off. important role here in this specific example, and we don't know it in this uh, group of lead type. I'm not saying that it's impossible to prove, but no one can go first and, and prove a variant of Verschik theorem. So there is, uh, there is room for a lot of work here. A lot of PhD students can uh, get uh, out of the street by this subject. Okay, I mean, I, I don't know how, how many of you of us are, are in Princeton. I'm not anymore there, but...